Hi, this is Paul. I want to pull a few things together that are sort of brewing out there in the conversation, one of which has to do with, with purpose in um, purpose in biology, let's say. And it, now that I've posted Peugeot's uh, first presentation at the Thunder Bay conference, and now that Michael Levin is becoming more and more familiar to our little corner of the internet, he's been on Karen Wong's channel a few times, he's talked to John Verveke, he was just on Lex Fridman. I want to pull some of these videos together a little bit, but I want to begin by noting that this is this is something that we've been talking about for a while. This is Sam on his Transfigured um, channel talking to John Verveke about this. Biology and evolution, right? So like the purpose of a polar bear is to hunt seals in the Arctic, right? Yes, and yes. so they are white because so that they can sneak up on seals. The purpose of their yeah. whiteness is so that they're harder to distinguish from the snow around them so that yeah. it, the, sneal, the seals can't see them as easily, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, and they're big and fluffy because it's cold, right? And, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's purpose in all the sorts of aspects of, uh, of a polar bear that are sort of, you know, all centered on their purpose which is, you know, hunting seals, but, you know, the polar bear isn't aware of its own whiteness, probably not, as right. the, the reason why it's white, you know, it, it knows to, you know, when they're sneaking up on seals, they cover their nose, right, with their paws, yeah. because their nose <laughs> is black, but they probably don't know why they do that sort of thing, right? Um, it, it's like at the level of instinct. So they're, well, I'm sure there's, you know, polar bears are probably, you know, more. And, and, and you know, when he when he says they don't know why they're doing that, that that's sort of getting into our conscious. I guess I got to adjust the camera a wee little bit. I got to adjust it here. Uh, maybe not. Maybe it's good enough. Um, get into this consciousness conversation too because i think in in some ways our the different levels of consciousness and our preoccupation with defining consciousness in the way that human beings experience it now i've i've you know played some of the the conversation with myself and john and you know, I would say my dog, well, I don't have a dog anymore, but um, when my dog was alive, my dog was conscious, um, but not as fully conscious as I was, that, as, as I am. The, and, and we talked about how, let's say, the level of consciousness that the dog has in the field, and we, that was in the egregore conversation, that the, you know, the, the dog runs through the field, and the dog sees the field in a particular way, and the dog is motivated by the, the, the field in a particular way. Um, if I'd have a dog uh, toy at home, the dog would relate to that toy in a particular way. I could, you know, shake the toy or show the dog the toy or do a particular thing. Uh, my son's dog, I, my, one of my sons has a dog, and it's a golden retriever, and that dog is ball crazy. Um, I, we, had, uh, we had my daughter's cat. My daughter picked up a stray cat when my daughter was living with us during COVID, and would play with the cat with these little balls, and then the cat went away when my daughter moved out. But a couple of those balls stayed like underneath furniture and hidden. We didn't know where they were. And sure enough, when that golden retriever came in the house, that golden retriever was just intensely interested in what was going on under the sofa. And sure enough, we'd pull out a ball. And the dog was still intensely interested in what was under the... And the dog was intensely interested in the sofa until we got out all the balls. And once we got out all the balls, the dog could relax because they got out all the balls. And you show them a ball and the ball's the dog's like... Grr. Well, that's there's a level of consciousness, but it's also consciousness and desire. So, so the polar bear um, certainly has a degree of desire... Uh, experiences opportunity and opposition, opportunity and threat. Um, the polar bear has a, has a level of consciousness that is appropriate to a polar bear. The polar bear is, is not conscious of sort of these higher levels of consciousness that we are. We are concerned about the polar bear's extinction. The polar bear is not concerned about its, its extinction. Our levels of, of consciousness are, 
are so much higher than let's the the other animals in the animal kingdom. Um, but but yet we we talk about consciousness with respect to with respect to those animals, at least lower levels of consciousness. Well, they they have some level of cognition and and that sort of thing. But there, there are purposes that are not in their own mind that they're acting out. And I, I don't think that you would disagree with any of that. Um, but I, I feel like it's almost like the theory, the, the process of evolution, the mechanism of evolution, the ability to encode a form right in sort of, you know, DNA and that sort of thing. And then to translate that into a form into, you know, there's the DNA of a polar bear which yeah. can get translated into an actual polar bear. Now, now, again, if you listen to Michael Levin on on Lex Fridman, uh, the DNA is only one small portion of the polar bear. And, and part of what I've mentioned before about the, the Levin conversation is that, in a very transjective way, the polar bear is also dependent on the polar bear's environment. You take that polar bear and you launch it into space, and that polar bear is will not live. Um, that polar bear, in some ways, becomes a different thing than the polar bear is in the world. Now, when I say a different thing, you immediately think about, well... Well, what do you mean a different thing? You know, now, okay, now it's it's now floating in space, and there's no gravity, and it's lifeless because it has no oxygen, and you know you have cellular cellular destruction because of you know there's now there's no longer pressure on the. I mean, all the different weird things that happen when you take a living organism and you throw them into space. Now the polar bear might be something that you're worried about in terms of your satellite hitting, or maybe not because it's fluffy. But um, you know, now, now, now your polar bear, your polar bear in space is space junk. Whereas when I've been watching Alone, the the one of the last seasons, and they're up in Labrador, and the even though at this point. I'm not all the way through the season. At this point, nobody's seen a polar bear, and it doesn't really look like anybody's going to see a polar bear. Um, there hasn't been a lot of bear activity in this particular uh, season of Alone, but of course they they tout it when it comes on the world's biggest you know land predator, the polar bear. But they don't see a polar bear. But if you're alone in Labrador on this television series, a polar bear is a threat to your life. A polar bear up in space is nothing. Uh, we're going to, again, talk about flatworms with Michael Levin because that's part of what he He talks about them being sort of immortal in that they don't age and die like we age and die, except you can easily kill a flatworm by taking it out of its environment or putting it in an unkind, you know, drop a flatworm into a, a, a vial, a test tube of acid, and you will no longer have a flatworm. In other words, it is it is also dependent on its environment. And if it's, if it's in a happy environment, the flatworm will do flatworm things, but you take that flatworm out of its environment and, it's, and it's a, it's a, it becomes a different thing. And then, you know, the polar bear has more polar bear offspring if everything goes well. That, that, that mechanism of, you know, information, embodiment of information, but also the search algorithm, right? You know, each child's yeah. a little different. There's some randomness and the randomness is useful, right? The randomness is because the environment changes or we're not a perfect polar bear yet. There, there's still room for improvement in polar bearness. And, and that it's this, it's, it's almost as if the purpose of evolution is purpose itself, right? Like there are a lot, you know, there's the purpose of an alligator, the purpose of a beetle, the purpose of a maple tree, the purpose of all of these different things. And they have lots of different sub purposes and make their livings in lots of different ways. But it's like life itself is searching for purpose itself, I would say. Now, what's interesting is that Sam in, in this conversation sort of pursues that. Now, now, Tripp and Sam will have a nice talk about the Aristotle's four causes, but then they make an observation about evolutionary biologists, which and the, and sort of the evolutionary biologist shtick, which I thought was was really helpful. 
that's this is my this is the wrong question it's very much the wrong question like you should be questioning your fundamental precepts about you know these things um and he he, he can't do that and I, I think that like that's why i think that the our, our modern view of causation is, is very very much flawed which i agree with jordan peterson and Paget's point but i don't think they have a very good way of describing it because i think that the way they describe it is kind of like it's just a, a noble fiction yeah yeah and and I think this is one of the things that I was really that Vervegi and I have bounced back and forth on each other a lot about this is I, I think that science like early science kind of undermined teleology and then also to some extent undermined formal cause. Right. Um, and that there was sort of this vacuum and that I think that what people don't realize happened is that evolutionary biology is basically letting teleology back into the, the scientific ontology without letting people know that that's what they're doing, right? Because like every time you make a, bi a, a evolutionary biology argument, you're basically making a teleological argument. And like when Brett and Heather Weinstein will argue, you know, for their evolutionary view of society and like, Oh, actually, marriage is, you know, the, the monogamy is helpful because it prevents there being a surplus of males and it helps both parents invest and their offspring in paternity certainty and, you know, reasons, 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 reasons of why marriage is good. But, you right. know, we're not claiming theology. We're just doing science. But no, they're doing it, it, the difference between what they're doing and what Aquinas does with natural law theology is nothing. No, <laughs> there is no difference because no, it's no. teleological argumentation. You're right. Yeah. And I thought that was a, a really important point. Now, I want to jump to Peugeot in the video that I posted. Now, I'm recording this on Wednesday. The video I, re I posted on Wednesday morning of Peugeot from Thunder Bay. Calls combinatorial explosion. The problem of framing as we approach reality that is, we, we realize that phenomena is, is too complex. As an artist, it's something that most anybody who's a painter or an artist, you come to realize that very fast. Because if you sit in front of something and you're trying to draw it or paint it, I was talking to someone today who, who is explaining that, that experience, uh, you realize there's way too much stuff out there. <laughs> and now, I am not an artist, and I do not draw well. And... What John said right here, Jonathan said right here, is exactly my experience when I sit down to try to draw something. Because Peterson has this great illustration of a helicopter. Called beliefs are really low resolution. They're just heuristics. They're like single pixel images. You haven't thought it through very carefully. Imagine, maybe you know more than the average person because of your background, but imagine how much you know about how a helicopter works. You know, do you know what a helicopter is? Yes. No, you don't. If you had to draw one, it would look like a four-year-old drew it. And there, that's, that's exactly his point. Right, we have, we walk around with these little low resolution images. Of, I know what a helicopter is. We'll draw one. You know, you know what it, you can identify the shape in two dimensions. You know it flies. That's about it. You couldn't fix one. You certainly couldn't build one. So in a real sense, you don't know anything about a helicopter. And you probably can't fly one because, you know, I don't know if you've ever learned, you got these sticks and, you know, you, ooh, this, that flying helicopters are not easy. Helicopter, except what you need as someone who's never around helicopters to know. And, and most things are way more complicated than helicopters, even though they're plenty complicated. And so you think that you know something when you think you know it, but then you detail out a counter argument. And it turns out that you've provided more detail in the counter argument that you had in your argument to begin with. And I actually have to find a, a through line. I have to discover, I have to engage with a structure which is hidden or there potentially in the thing that I'm looking at. And and, and so for an artist to reproduce something, you're, you're going to have to find a through line. Now, 
my wife is a Waldorf teacher. They do a lot of drawing in Waldorf, and so actually as part of her prep, she learned how to, she, she actually could draw fairly well before this. I remember when we were dating, found, you know, she had these little pictures of dogs and cats that she drew. So I was like, oh, she, she draws quite well, and some of my kids draw quite well. I didn't get it from me. But then when I look at, so if my wife is teaching her students how to draw things, well, there's all these ways that you learn how to draw things. You can go to YouTube and you can find how to draw a cat, how to draw this, how to draw that. And, and what you do is you begin to construct it. But, but Peugeot is right. You sort of need a through line that, that gets you there. One of the things I realized when I was in my 20s was that actually that's probably how we deal with most things. That we have to find a through line, as John, the, the term that John uses, which I like a lot as we frame phenomena. And what I think is, I think that if we understand it that way and we look at it that way. And, and so it's in the middle of the week and I'm working on sermon stuff because I'm preaching this Sunday and that's it's very much the way I go about a text. I'll, I'll read the text, I'll do a little work in the original language probably, I'll get around to some commentaries, I'll think about it, I'll think about illustrations. The sermon doesn't come together until I find the through line, because generally speaking, uh, a lot of preachers will teach you that the um, the the serious problem for any the, the the biggest downfall of any sermon is too many disconnected points. What you need is a through line that the people can sort of follow. Now it's got to be interesting enough. It's got to go to interesting places, and it's got to connect with their life. But there there needs to be that through line. We're going to come to a manner of understanding how the good uh, arises from that. Um, and so one of the things you realize, and this is, you've heard me talk about the glass a million times if you watch any of my videos, but one of the things you realize is that when you engage with things in the world, uh, you engage with them with a, a purpose. So like our categories. Now, our level of consciousness with which we do this is very low because it would be very costly. We, I mean, I, I'm thirsty, I grab this, I drink it. Now there's all sorts of low resolution things to it. If this was a different color, if maybe its source were unknown, if maybe a homeless person gave this to me, it'd be like, or if it was like too yellow. Um, I mean, there's a whole, because here's the thing about a glass, it can be used as something to hold a cool, refreshing drink, or it can be used as something, if you've ever been on a long trip, I remember there's one incident where we're on a long trip, and, um, you know, a bottle, a little boy, uh, yeah. And uh, it doesn't work so well for girls, but it can work pretty well for boys. But, you know, just make sure that you know what's in the bottle um, before you start passing that sucker around. Are not, just abs are not just concrete categories that are completely arbitrary, but that they start, at least, they start in categories of engagement, right? So it's like a glass is something, it's a container, it's something that I drink from, and that's why I can't... And, and now, these levels of engagement is, is really important because the dog engages with the ball. There, there's a desire that the dog has for the ball. And, and for the dog, the ball is a good. And um, all, of the, all of the combinatory explosiveness of my living room for that dog goes right down into that ball. Now, for us, because we're not focused on that ball, um, we're seeing, oh, does he have a dirty snout? Is he mucking up the carpet? Why is he digging around? What's the dog doing? We're trying to have a conversation and the dog won't sit still. I mean, the, the, the living room was full of different things, but, but something is condensing the room via consciousness, via, the, you know, for that dog. Care about it. And that's why I care enough about it for me to have a category for it or for me to engage with it in a manner that, that makes it hold together as a phenomena. Because what we, what we realize is that phenomena is, it is combinatorial explosive. There are many aspects to this. Like we could say, you know, what is it the example that's always used is I could use this as a, as a weapon. I could use it to prop up something. I could, it has all kinds of possibilities in it, but I engage with it. As I engage with it, then it, it manifests itself to us as, uh, 
an identity. And that identity is almost, in some way, it's identical with its... Now, now the, the dog, the retriever, can't say ball. The retriever knows what ball is, and, and the retriever has an astounding capacity to uh, recognize ball. And the, the retriever has a limited number of things that the retriever recognizes, far fewer things than what I recognize. But yeah, um, there is, the, it's the good of play that the retriever has learned from my son, because my son's a good dog owner and my son very regularly takes that dog out to the park and it's just ball, 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 ball. Now, of course, ball is in many ways a substitute for, we used to have a, a rice farmer in the church here and he he would often in the back of his pickup truck, his farmers would drive pickup trucks, he would always often have his dog with him in the back of the pickup truck. And I remember one day, I've told the story before, um, there were some turkeys that were roaming around and I was talking to my friend and and we were looking at the turkeys and, and I asked him, I said, what would your dog do if you, because the dog usually hunts ducks because my friend was a rice farmer and then in the in the winter they would flood the fields for the migratory birds and he would have a duck blind and he would have duck hunting on his rice farm, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the retriever was used to ducks and so the retriever could differentiate between ducks and other birds. The retriever would also love to chase a ball. And of course, there's a lot going on with that. But then the um, the turkeys were birds of a different category. And so and so he said, all right, let's find out. So we opened up the, the kennel in the back of the truck and um, dog came bounding out because the dog's like, okay, it's time to play. It's time to play. And then he made a motion towards the turkeys and the dog was like, now, the dog doesn't know the name turkey, but the dog clearly knew the difference between a turkey and a duck, and the dog was not about to monkey with those turkeys. So you have all these levels that are going on. And, and again, again, there, there's clearly consciousness involved in, in the dog and his behavior. It's good. That is, when I perceive a glass, I'm always judging whether it's a good glass because I want to drink from it. Like if I'm walking out on the floor and I'm doing it unconsciously in the sun ways or I'm not doing fully consciously. I'm always asking myself whether or not the floor is going to hold me or I trust that it's going to hold me because that's why that's why I have a category for it in the first place. And it's the same with even it's sometimes it, it looks harder when we look at the scientific categories. But the scientific categories are framed, first of all, in our experience categories. It is the, just the experience that we have every day. And so we, why is it, even in terms of science, why is it that some aspects of science get more funding, get more attention than others? It's because they're always couched in categories of care. Ultimately, they're couched in what is important to us in terms of humans. And, and it's not only categories of care of individuals who are seeking it, it's categories of care of the collective of human beings because not only do we act this way, does the retriever act this way with respect to the ball, and does Jonathan act this way with respect to the, with respect to the glass, but the community acts this way with respect to cancer or climate or um, or COVID or or whatever the community is caring about. Um, and so what I what I realized uh, a while ago is that I think that that's what Dante is talking about in the Commedia. And so I've been really thinking a lot about the way that Dante engages with, with uh, the way that he sees the, this movement that humans have out into the world. And he talks about it exactly in that way. He, he couches it in two notions, which is love, the love and the good. That is, all humans perceive a good toward which they move and that they at least think, or at least hope, that they will find rest in that good. The, the dog pursues the ball because it's pursuing a good in the ball. Now, the, the dog's capacity to consciously frame and articulate that good that it sees in the ball is very limited. And, and we can list a variety of goods that the dog finds in the ball. The dog finds... Uh, communion with the master because dogs very much like to please their masters. The dog, the dog finds you know a a, a connection with 
you know, the, the purpose of retrievers that has been bred into them by, by human beings. I mean, there's all kinds of things, but yet the dog's conscious connection with all of this is extremely limited. And so if you think about it, every single one of your movements and anything that you do can be framed that way. That is, I walk into a room. And, and those movements are sometimes conscious and those movements are sometimes unconscious. If you're, I remember as a kid on a playground, um, junior high playground was one big black top. And, you know, there's all kinds of different ball games going over inside. You know, if there's a ball whizzing towards your head that even if you're not paying any attention to, you duck. And of course, as a kid in college and high school, you'd play these flinch games. You know, it'd make you flinch. Well, it's natural to flinch. And, and even even the flinching is, is sort of pursuing a good, which is self-preservation. But it's not necessarily conscious in, in the full sense that, that we usually think about in terms of our experience. I have a reason why I'm walking to a room. It can be a very very minimal reason it could be a small good but it has to be a good or else i wouldn't i wouldn't move i would just stand here paralyzed but but if i'm moving somewhere i'm moving in a direction towards something if i grab something i'm doing it for a reason and it's always because i'm looking to rest in a good if i grab a glass it's because i think i if i drink it i will find a good there and if i you know, if I walk into a building, if I go to a shopping mall, if I do anything I do, and sometimes that good can just be, you know, if I want to go for a walk and I want to free my, clear my mind or whatever it is, every single, every single motion we do, and it's, I think it's probably actually most of the time true even for things that we're not totally conscious of, that we actually act towards goods. We protect ourselves from things that will hurt us and we move towards things that we recognize as, as being good. And so the reason why I'm, I'm talking about this is because that's, I think, related to the problem of the combinatorial explosion problem, which is the categories that we have and the categories we even perceive. Now, now, even just using the word categories is a little deceptive because when we say the word categories, we probably think about lists and or or things within a Venn diagram or something something very conscious like that and and Peugeot is making basically making the case that we have deep categories categorizations within us um, threat or or opportunity let's say there's a there's a there's a very basic simple cat couple categories that are there but glass so you can get up higher you know glass ball, some of these categories. I mean, is a, is a glass something that I, I put drink in or is a, a glass something that, you know, is it is it something I drink out of or is, is it a chamber pot in a situation in which I uh, don't have an opportunity for a better vessel in order to relieve myself? Um, and and so but but then there's sort of like this this category beneath it which is like container but again category is is a very is a fairly well defined word but these are very deep within us in the world are related to their good so you know an apple is it a good apple that means a different thing than uh, a good chair or, or a good anything or even even in terms of science which it's super interesting because because scientists, when they study something, they will, they will reduce all the parameters down to their variables that they're looking for. And they will, they will create a, a, a frame, and then they will have to judge whether or not the facts they're looking at fit the good that they're aiming for. But there's no other way to do it. So you have to decide, I'm studying this for this reason, and now I have to see which facts, because I'm obviously, if I'm studying I'm studying a rhinoceros, right? It's like I'm not going to be looking at the clouds because that doesn't, that doesn't fit in the good that I'm looking for. And even, even if I'm studying a rhinoceros, I have to study the rhinoceros in a certain direction, in a certain frame. And, and you might say, well, what do, you, what do you mean the good that you're looking for? Well, maybe you're trying to find an aspect of rhinoceros that will improve its uh, viability given that rhino rhinoceros, the rhinoc you know, it's an endangered species. Um, and so, so even you, you come at it with a valence, you don't come at it disinterested or you wouldn't 
study the rhinoceros, you might be more interested in studying the, the golden retriever. A certain aspect of it. And then all the facts, I'm going to see which facts fit in that good. And some of them which don't fit so much, there's always going to be things that are going to be kind of on the margin. And I have to decide where do I cut off? Where do I remove, remove the facts? So maybe rhinoceros reproduction is, is an important thing for me, but rhinoceros, um, uh, how rhinoceros smell to school children is unimportant to me. That don't fit into the good that I'm caring about and which ones do, and then I can get to the, the purpose that I'm doing. So even science actually functions in that manner in the, the process. So often people will then describe the results of science and say, well, here are these objective results and everything, but those objective results are always couched in someone searching for a good and organizing facts towards a purpose and then deciding, not deciding or perceiving which facts fit and aim at the good that they're, that they're trying to find. And sometimes a scientist will, 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 will identify a good, will start to organize facts towards that, and they'll realize that, no, the facts just don't, they don't actually, you can't reach the, the, the thing that I'm doing. My theory... We, we, we can't have a litter of rhinoceros. What, what's the plural of rhinoceros? The plural form is also rhinoceros. So, so we can't have a litter of rhinoceros. A rhinoceros can't have, oh, now we got to figure out what a baby rhinoceros is called, what, what their little groupings are called. The collective form, the collective noun for a group of rhinoceroses is crash. So you can't have, um, you can't have a, a litter or a crash of 13 baby rhinoceroses from one female. Um, they, 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 don't, they don't reproduce that many at that time, even if we want to. Their, their lifespan is 35 to 50 years. Maybe we'd like the rhinoceros to live longer if they're endangered. It doesn't work. So I have to find a new theory to try to gather these facts together uh, if I'm going to make sense of, of, of the world. Um, and so what are the things that I've, one of the things that, I, that I've been thinking of is that that, I think, is ultimately, just that is the source of morality or the source of the good. We, we, we see the good in things, but then there's a manner in which as soon as that becomes a question of people or as soon as that becomes a question of others that I see in them a uh, reflection of, of myself, I see them as like me, then the good of the good of the glass, which is there to drink out of, becomes a different kind of good. Okay, well, we'll hold off on this. Is gonna is gonna take it in another way, but I now a lot of like if you read a lot of brain stuff, brain books, and I mean one of the arguments for determinism is that a lot of this work that he's describing here is sort of pre conscious. Well, what do I mean by that? I mean, sort of the higher level conscious that we have as human beings, that we move and then we will make up a story. And it might be a good story. It might even be a valid or a true story. But our capacity to, to monologue the reason behind the movement and the categorization and all of that temporally comes second. And, and what's really fascinating is, again, if you go back to Sam's point about evolutionary biologists, that's a, that's, that's a really rather extreme example of that because, well, the, you know, this animal does this thing in order for these reasons, and the animal itself is never going to have those reasons. It's never going to be able to articulate those reasons. Those reasons exist in a mapping which is far above and beyond the capacity of those animals. The really the, the reason the dog is so is so ball crazy is the dog will never sit down and articulate that reason. That is a story that you are telling. Now I'm not saying it's an untrue story or a bad story, but but that is in a way how the world is put together and how we as human beings very much uniquely see it. But there seems to be something built into the world 
that is seeking these goods. Okay, now we'll get into some of the Mike 11 stuff from his, um, from his Lex Fridman conversation here. Ask, for example, well, how does it remember what the correct shape is? And can we mess with that memory? Can we give it a false memory of what the shape should be and let the cells build something else? Or can we mess with the measurement apparatus, right? So it gives you, it gives you those kinds of, so, so, the, so the idea is to basically uh, appropriate a lot of the um, approaches and concepts from cognitive neuroscience and behavioral science into things that uh, previously were taken to be dumb materials. And, you know, you'd get yelled at in class if you, if you, for being anthropomorphic, if you said, well, my cells want to do this and my cells want to do that. And I think, I think that's, a, that's a major mistake that leaves a ton of capabilities on the table. So thinking about biologic systems as things that have memory, have almost something like cognitive ability. <laughs> but, I mean, how incredible is it, you know, that the salamander arm is being rebuilt not with a dictator it's kind of like the cellular automata system all the individual workers are doing their own thing so where's that uh we... it, it, it's almost genesis one let the earth bring forth let the salamander bring forth top-down signal that does the control coming from like how can you find it yeah like why does it stop growing how does it know the shape how does it and, and and now that is such a scientific question. How can you find it? Well, what are you looking for? Peterson in his one of his conversations mentioned deism because this turn to deism in the in the 16th 17th century is a vital piece of this because suddenly everything gets mechanical. I want to somehow take this apart and find the gears. There are no gears in there because and this is where I think. Verveke's transjective perspective is vitally important and it gets back to the polar bear because well where's the where can I locate the blueprint I mean this is this is like this is almost like something directly from the book of Job you know where were you when I mapped out the stars well where on earth is this blueprint well how does the salamander know not only how to grow a new appendage but but more importantly how the cells will differentiate and stop growing when the appendage has achieved its purpose. Memory of the shape. And how does it tell everybody to be like, whoa, 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 slow down, we're done. So the first thing to, th to, to think about, I think, is that there are no examples anywhere of, of a central dictator because in, in, this, in this kind of science, because everything is made of parts and so we we even though we we feel now, now what does he mean by that was well, central dictator well we're gonna we're gonna try and look for some homunculus that's inside the salamander and he's barking out orders and of course that's a picture that we that we say and in fact we might in fact tell a story that's like that to sort of make sense of it on our level but there's something built into the world that is doing this and again it's I mean, you're just going to scream out teleological, cosmological arguments when you when you get to this point. Feel as a unified central sort of intelligence and kind of point of of cognition, we are a bag of neurons, right? We the, all intelligence is collective intelligence. There's this. The, this is important to to kind of um, think about because a lot of people think, okay, there's real intelligence like me. And then there's collective intelligence, which is ants and flocks of birds and, you know, termites and things like that. And, and you know. Well, how about the collective intelligence that we participate in? Well, let's go a little bit more. And, and, and maybe it's appropriate to think of them as, a, as, a, as, a, as an individual, and maybe it's not. A lot of people are skeptical about, about that and so on. But it's got, you've got to realize that we are not, there's, there's no such thing as this like indivisible diamond of intelligence that's like this one central thing that's not made of parts. We are all made of parts. And so... If if you believe, which I think is is, is hard to uh, to get around, that 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 we in fact have a centralized um, set of goals and preferences, and we plan and we do things and so on, you are already committed to the fact that a collection of cells is able to do this because we are a collection of cells. There's no and and of course this goes levels above us and of course levels below us because the bees are doing this and the squirrels are doing this and you know the squirrels the squirrels don't get together and sort of have a meeting and and say. Well, you know, it's who's who's been like leaving little scratch marks on the roots to let us know exactly how many days that are the squirrels aren't doing that. There's no, you know, Department of Centralized Squirrel Intelligence that is sort of monitoring all of this. 
And, and of course, it's the same within our body. But then, again, it also goes up from us. I'm getting around that. In our case, what we do is we navigate the three-dimensional world, and we have behavior. This is blowing my mind right now, because we are just a collection of cells. Oh, yeah, yeah. So There's... when I'm moving this arm... <laughs> this, is, this is an illustration right out of C.S. Lewis's book, Miracles. I feel like I'm the central dictator of that action, but there's a lot of stuff going on. Like every, all, all the cells here are co collaborating in yeah. some interesting way. They're getting signal from the ce central nervous system. Well, even the central nervous system is, is misleadingly named because it isn't really central. Again, it's, it's what, it's what, just what a bunch you, of cells. it's just a bunch of cells. I mean, all of the, right. There are no, you, there are no singular indivisible intelligences anywhere. And, and so even when you say central nervous system, you have in a sense enacted this Peugeotian gestalt and saying, just like the glass, well, there is the central nervous system and it and we're going to say that my fingernails are not a part of the central nervous system, but my spine is. So it's going to have boundaries. And then there's going to be areas that are sort of um, sort of a little bit, well, what about what about the nerves that are you know deeply connected down to my fingernails? Because if you pull my fingernail off, it's going to hurt. And but and this is this is this is this is in fact how we are. We are all every every example that we've ever seen is is a collective of some of something. It's just that we're used to it. We're used to that. You know, we're used to okay. This thing is kind of a single thing, but it's really not. You zoom in, you know what you see. You see a bunch of cells running around. And so, is there some unifying? I mean, we're just jumping around, but that something that you look at as the 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 bioelectrical signal versus the biochemical, the um, the chemistry, the electricity. Maybe <laughs> he's trying to make sense of this. Ah, it's going to be a little while, Lex. This is this, this is this is kind of hard to get your mind around. The life is in that versus the cells. It's it, in, you see again. It's in that. Well, it's not just in that. The polar bear is in the Arctic. The polar bear and the Arctic are deeply intertwined. If you take the polar bear out of the Arctic, it becomes a different thing. They say, no, 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 it's a, it's, you can, you can, you know, put a net around it. You can put a great ha hair net around the polar bear and so it doesn't drop any of its, no, it's a different thing when it's out of the Arctic than when it's rolling around wild. And we all know this because you go and see a polar bear in the zoo and it's like, yeah, but I'd rather see a polar bear in the wild. Why? Is it a different thing in the wild? Yes, it is. It's a very different thing in space. So this you know, getting our mind around what we're talking about here is no small thing. It's the uh, there's there's an orchestra playing and uh, the resulting music is the dictator. That's not bad, um, Dennis. That's Dennis Noble's uh, kind of view of things. He has he has two really good books where he talks about this musical analogy, right? So so I think that's 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 I, I like it. Um, I like it. Is it wrong though? I don't think it's no. I don't think it's wrong. Um, I, I don't I don't think it's wrong. I think I think the important thing ab about it is that we have to come to grips with the fact that a true a a, a true proper uh, cognitive intelligence can still be made of parts those things are and in fact it has to be and, and i I've, i i think it's a real shame but i see this all the time when you have uh, when you have a collective like this whether it be a collective a group of robots or a, you know a, a collection of cells or neurons or whatever as soon as as soon as we gain some insight into how it works Right, meaning that oh, I see. In order to take this action, here's the information that got processed via this chemical mechanism or whatever. Immediately, people say, "Oh, well, then that's not real cognition. That's just physics." And I think this is this is fundamentally flawed because if you zoom into anything, what are you going to see? Of course, you're just going to see physics. What else could? If if you zoom into the golden retriever, there's physics in the golden retriever. Um, I mean, it, it's sort of like we talked about this at Thunder Bay. It's sort of like that old. That old idea that well, if you put someone on a really, on a really accurate scale and have them there at the moment of death, you know what? Well, maybe you can weigh the soul. The soul isn't a substance within the dog. In that, whereas I, in many ways, am sort of contained by this body. 
I'm not really fully contained by this body. There's a P you have, by virtue of how much video you've listened to me, you have a piece of me in you. I've colonized certain parts of your consciousness, Congress. I've gone out into the world in all kinds of different ways. Um, and, and I've used the illustration before. Let's say um, your grandfather dies and leaves his body to science. And what that means is that some med students are going to um, take grandpa apart and use grandpa's body to study anatomy. How much of grandpa will they learn by dissecting him? Now, who knows grandpa better? Grandma or the medical student? Well, that depends a lot on these very basic low-level categories. Could be underneath, right? It's not going to be fairy dust. It's going to be physics and chemistry. But that doesn't take away from the magic of the fact that there are certain ways to arrange that physics and chemistry. And in particular, he said magic. In particular, the bioelectricity, which, which I like a lot, uh, to give you an emergent uh, collective with goals and preferences and memories and anticipations that do not belong to any of the subunits. So I think what we're... Right, right what he said there. Pretty darn important. Getting into these give you an emergent uh, collective with goals and preferences and memories and anticipations that do not belong to any of the subunits. So I think what we're getting into here, and we can talk about um, how, how this happens during embryogenesis and so on, what we're getting into is uh, the origin of, the se of, of a self. Yeah, with a big with a capital S. So we ourselves, there are many other kinds of selves, and we can tell some really interesting stories about where selves come from and how they become unified. Yeah, is this the first and wow. Well, how how high do these selves go? So I've been I've been listening to and doing a little bit of work on the Iliad and just having a fun time. And and part of what's so cool about it is of course if you if you don't just watch, let's say, the movie Troy, um, or if you don't just watch some sort of modern, um, storified version of the story, which tends to be something that's made easy for us, but you try, even if you don't know any Greek, you try to maybe find a good um, translation of it, and, and just... there's. there's just the translations of the Iliad isn't a is a whole nerdy world that you can really get lost in, and you just type that. I mean, there's how many different ways? Just in the last twenty years, different authors are trying to render this book. But um, just just the just the way that we think about collectives and gods and and what what how all of this is supposed to work. Iliad by Homer. Book One. Sing, goddess, the anger of Peleus' son Achilles and its devastation, which put pains thousandfold upon the Achaeans. Now, it's not terribly easy to understand right away, and and that's where I played. I played some of the um, the great courses, which is which is sort of a nice thing to go along to sort of help bring bring reference. But the the wrath of Achilles is is central to this whole thing. Hurled in their multitudes to the house of Hades, strong souls of heroes, but gave their bodies to be the delicate feasting of dogs, of all birds. And the will of Zeus was accomplished since that time when first there stood in division of conflict Atreus' son, the lord of men, and brilliant Achilles. Now, now Atreus' son is Agamemnon and uh, Achilles. What god was it then set them together in bitter collision? Zeus's son and Leto's, Apollo, who in anger at the king drove the foul pestilence along the host, and the now, again, this doesn't come through. I just sort of scanned the movie Troy, and 
um, I had watched it years and years ago, and it's you know it's it's just it's completely modern and secular. It just just breezes over all of this all of this stuff that's that's built into the epic. Anger of Achilles, which was devastating to the Greeks. All of this happened somehow to accomplish the will of Zeus. The anger of Achilles led to the quarrel with Agamemnon, and so on. So why is Achilles angry? He is angry because Agamemnon took away Achilles' concubine, Briseis. Now, just to remind you of the relationship between Achilles and Agamemnon, Achilles is the greatest warrior that the Greeks have at Troy, without question. But Agamemnon is the leader of the expedition. Agamemnon is not king of the Greeks, as is often said. There is no unified Greece. There is no unified king of the Greeks at this point in the culture as reflected in the Iliad. However, Agamemnon is the leader of the expedition to Troy. Achilles is a king over his own kingdom. Agamemnon is a king. Menelaus is a king. Odysseus is a king. But Agamemnon is recognized as, in some sense, the leader, at least, of this particular expedition, if not the leader in general. So Agamemnon... Various other kinds of, you know, many, many different kinds of complex systems. If that helps me to control and and predict and build such systems, then then that's all there is to say. There's no more philosophy to argue about. So so I like competency in that way because you can quantify. You could you have to. In fact, you have to. You have to make a claim. Competent at what? And then now, of course, when he's talking about competency here, now I'm going to get back to Odysseus. I haven't I haven't me I haven't mismixed these little sound bites here, but. Competency, that's all about this Peugeotian thread through. Because competency is is the is the excellence in pursuing a goal. Then or if I say if I tell you it has a goal, the question is what's the goal and how do you know? And I say, well, because every time I deviated from this particular state, that's what it spends energy to get back to that. The polar bear has competency in hunting seals. The polar bear does not have competency in being a satellite. That's the goal, and we can quantify it, and we can be objective about it. So, so, so the the we, and we're not used to thinking about this. I, I I give a talk sometimes called "Why Don't Robots Get Cancer?" Right, and the reason robots don't get cancer is because, generally speaking, with a few exceptions, our our architectures have been you've got a bunch of dumb parts, and you hope that if you put them together, the 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 overlying machine will have some intelligence and do something or other, right? But the individual parts don't don't care; they don't have an agenda. Biology isn't like that. Every level has a, an agenda, and the final outcome is the result of cooperation and competition both within and across levels. So for example, during embryogenesis, your tissues and organs are competing with each other. And it's actually a really important part of development. There's a reason they compete with each other. They're not all just, uh, you know, sort of uh, helping each other. They're also competing for, for information, for metabolic, for limited metabolic um, constraints. But to get back to your, your your other point, which is you know which is which is this seems like really efficient and, and good and, and and so on compared to some of our human efforts, we also have to keep in mind that what happens here is that each level bends the option space for the level beneath, so that your parts basically they don't see the 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 geometry. So so, so I'm I'm using um. And I and I and I think uh, I, I take this this seriously uh, terminology from from like um, from like relativity right where where the space is literally bent so the option space is deformed by the higher levels so that the lower levels all they really have to do is go down their concentration gradient they don't have to in fact they don't they can't know what the big picture is but if you bend the space just right if they do what locally seems right they end up doing your bidding they end up doing things that are optimal in the in the higher space conversely. Because the components are good at getting their job done, you as the higher level don't need to, uh, to try to compute all the low level controls. All you're doing is bending the space. You don't know or care how they're going to do it. I'll give you a super simple example in the, um, in the tadpole. We found that, okay, so, so tadpoles need to become frogs and to, become a fro to go from a tadpole head to a frog head, you have to rearrange the face. They need to become frogs. So the eyes have to move forward, the jaws have to come out, the nostrils move, like everything moves. It used to be thought that because all tadpoles look the same and all frogs look the same, if you just remember, if every piece just moves in the right direction, the right amount, then you get your you get your frog, right? So we decided to, to test. We I, I had this hypothesis that I thought I thought actually the system is probably more intelligent than that. So what did we do? We made uh, what we call Picasso tadpoles. So these are so everything is scrambled. So the eyes are on the back of the head, their jaws are off to the side. Everything is scrambled. Well, guess what they make? They make pretty normal frogs because all the different things move around in novel paths configurations until they get to the correct uh, froggy uh, you know sort of frog face mm -hmm. configuration then they now, now one of the things that 
when you study the Bible and you study eschatology is that eschatology isn't so much emergence where we sort of imagine that the present is pushing towards the future. It's much more that the future is pulling the present towards itself. It's almost like the face of the frog is pulling the tadpole's features towards the face of the frog. Now, now what's fun about the Iliad is it's a very different culture. It's very foundational for our culture. But um, just, just think about how the wrath of Achilles and his conflict with Agamemnon is, is going to pull this catastrophe, which is what the book is about. The book is about a catastrophe because it, in, in so many ways, no one is satisfied except for, and, and even the gods are all sort of jockeying to for supremacy here. No one is satisfied, but, but you, you almost have the sense that the, the future is pulling the story towards itself. Is, to some degree, Achilles superior in terms of authority, but Achilles is without question the greatest warrior whom the Greeks have. Agamemnon has taken away Achilles' concubine, Briseis. And this is the motivation for Achilles' anger, which causes him to withdraw from the fighting. But to understand the nature of Achilles' anger, to understand why he is so outraged and enraged when Agamemnon takes away his concubine, we need to talk a little bit about the Homeric warriors' motivations for fighting in the first place. What are the Greeks there fighting for? Yes, they're fighting to get Helen back. But on a broader level, on a wider level, why are they fighting? What does the individual Greek warrior want to get out of battle, out of going to war in the first place? Homeric warriors fight for two main things. They fight for time, which is usually translated as honor, and for glory or fame, which is usually translated as kleos. The reason I like to use the Greek terms here, rather than just saying they fight for honor and for glory, is because our terms honor and glory are not exact equivalents for what these Greek words mean. The Greek concepts are a little bit different from any concepts that we actually have and require a little bit of explanation in consequence. Time, as I already said, is usually translated as honor, but it does not mean an internalized sense of honor, a personal sense of honor by which you validate yourself no matter what others think of you. Rather, Time refers to the externalized, tangible, physical representations of honor. Time is what you are given by your peers. If you're a god, Time is what you are given through sacrifices that humans make to you. It is material, physical, tangible, and therefore removable. In fact, Time, the kind of honor conferred by Time is often referred to as a zero-sum game. If I have more Time, you have less. It's not like our concept of honor where it's more or less infinitely expandable and how much honor you may have has no bearing on how much honor I have. No, notice the difference in capacity for conceptualization. Time is a zero-sum game. If I get more of it, by definition, you get less and vice versa. Now, Time is most usually expressed, in the Homeric poems at least, by gifts, booty, prizes, the actual objects that warriors gain when they sack enemy cities. Gold, cattle, armor, slaves, particularly slave women. Briseis, therefore, is the tangible, visible expression of Achilles' time. When Agamemnon takes her away from him, this is much more than merely a sexual affront. Achilles is jealous, I think, on the sexual level. Briseis is his concubine, Agamemnon has taken her, but there is much more going on in this quarrel between Achilles and Agamemnon than purely or merely sexual jealousy. Agamemnon's affront to Achilles' time is much more important, much more serious than that might seem to indicate. Briseis is, in fact, Achilles' geras, another Greek term, which means a particular prize. Geras is often translated prize of honor, representation of time, the best prize that can be given to a warrior by his peers to indicate how great a warrior he is. That now, now, it's really important to notice that it's given by their peers, and this will be important a little bit later in the Iliad when they're talking about, when there's this, this whole conversation about whether or not they should attack Troy or just go back to Greece. And, you know, people make the comment that, well, Agamemnon, well, he's got all of this stuff. And, you know, it's very much a trickle-down economy that Agamemnon or Achilles or the, the head honchos, they get their they get their first prize and, you know, they get they get all the goodies voted up the ladder and the guys down below get a lot less. That'll, that's, that isn't lost to the ancients. 
That is what Briseis is to Achilles. That is what Agamemnon takes away from him. I'll come back to Agamemnon's motivations in a few minutes, but what about this other term that I said Greek warriors fight for, or Homeric warriors fight for, rather, kleos. Kleos is usually translated as glory or fame or sometimes reputation. What it literally means is what people say about you, what is spoken aloud about you. And obviously, Time and Kleos are very, very closely connected. The more Time you have, the more Kleos you are likely to get. The more visible signs of honor are given to you, the more great things people are likely to say about you. So that it's an interlock. We can use the word status system here of Time and Kleos. But Kleos also, very importantly, serves as the only true form of immortality available to a Homeric warrior. Kleos is what people say about you at any time, but particularly what people say about you after you are dead. How your reputation, your fame, your glory lives on after you die is the main point of Kleos, the main interest that Homeric warriors have in Kleos. If Achilles loses his Time, if he is dishonored, dis in the view of his fellow warriors, if he is no longer given these visible, tangible side signs of honor, then what happens to his Kleos after he is dead? Is he remembered as the greatest warrior or not? Probably not. So Agamemnon has done much more to Achilles than simply take away a sexual partner. He has, in effect, dishonored Achilles, both in Achilles' own eyes and in the eyes of the assembled Greek army, and has done so in an extremely grievous and important way. Why did Agamemnon do this? Why would a commander-in-chief treat his former warrior this way? Agamemnon dishonors Achilles, or removes Achilles' Time, because of an affront to his own Time. Agamemnon has suffered a loss that, at first glance, is very similar to the loss he inflicts on Achilles. Agamemnon has had to return his own geras, his own prize of honor, his own representation of Time. The concubine, the slave woman, Chryseis, daughter of a priest of Apollo named Chryses. Agamemnon has been forced to return this girl to her father. By the way, I know it's annoying that Briseis and Chryseis sound so much alike, and just to make matters even worse, that Chryseis' father is named Chryses, but there's nothing we can do about it. That's the names that have come down to us, and we just have to deal with them. Now, now if you think about all of this relationality, because that's what it is, all of this relationality as, in some ways, the, elect the electrical signals beneath the, the systems that are the collectives that are us. But you've got a much bigger collective, which is in this case the, um, the Greeks from Greece fighting. Uh, the Trojans are Greek too. I mean, that's the, the Achaeans. That's what, the, um, that's what they're called in there. The Achaeans versus the Trojans. You know, this is... This is this, this is all of this happening, all of the categories, all of the definitions. Um, Agamemnon thus tries to restore his own lost Time, the removal of Chryseis, his concubine, by taking Achilles Geras, Geras Briseis. Now, Agamemnon, I said, is forced to return his concubine to her father. In the opening section of the Iliad, the, set, the situation is set up very quickly, very abruptly by the poet. At first, Agamemnon ref Now, she makes the point earlier that this starts in the middle of the story. Every, all, of the, all of the bard's audiences would have had an understanding of the Trojan War, of the main characters, of the heroes, of the gods. The story begins in the middle. They're nine years into this 10-year war, and it's at the point in the war where, you know, maybe the Greeks have sort of, they, they can't get through those Trojan walls. They're, you know, it's they've lost a lot of men. They've got all of these sunk costs. They don't know whether to go further. So then in the second chapter, you have this this question, Zeus is going to, out of, you know, in hearing the supplication of all of the, all of the relational connections that Achilles has, Zeus is going to, yeah, Agamemnon and the Achaeans are going to win, but they're going to win at a huge cost. And what's fascinating is that the gods are really there's a there's a deep there's a deep ambivalence for the gods in Homer. They they're cruel, they they take away. Um, it just sucks to not be a god. It sucks to be a human being. 
refuses to return Chryseis to her father. Her father Chryseis comes to the camps of the Greeks, begs for his daughter's return. He is carrying the emblems of his rank as a priest of the god Apollo. And in Apollo's name, he begs for the return of his daughter. Now, in the story itself, it's 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 emphasized that the gifts that the, the priest is bringing to bring back his daughter are suitable so that for the for the priest to not return his daughter, for the for Agamemnon to not return the priest's daughter, is is not right. There's um there's a scorekeeping, there's a moral scorecard that's in play here. Agamemnon refuses. Chryses therefore goes away and prays to his god Apollo, who by the way is the god of plague and sickness as well as the god of medicine and healing. Chryses pray, prays to Apollo to smite the Greeks and make them regret that they would not return Chryseis to him. And so you have all of these, the arrows of Apollo, the arrows of Apollo, it's just nine years they've been there trying to get in there and it's plague, plague, plague and they're stuck outside the walls of Troy and their armies are withering because plague is eating them and and... Apollo therefore sends a plague. This is the thousandfold pains referred to in the opening lines of the Iliad. Apollo sends a plague upon the Greeks that causes the death of a great many Greek warriors. Agamemnon asks his prophet what he must do to lift the plague and is told you must return Chryseis. So far so good. Why would Agamemnon take it out on Achilles? Because Achilles had been one of the foremost Greeks who argued that Agamemnon ought to give Chryseis back. From the beginning, Achilles had said, you should give her back to her father. You should not affront the priest of Apollo by keeping her. Agamemnon therefore sees this as somehow, if not Achilles' fault, at least something that it's reasonable to make Achilles suffer for. Also, Agamemnon is reasserting his own rank. He has visibly lost Timae in the eyes of his men. Briseis was sorry, Chryseis was taken away from him. He has to reassert his rank as the foremost authority among the Greeks. How better to do that than by to prove that he is in control by taking away the prize of honor of the greatest warrior, Achilles. Although Agamemnon has suffered this affront to his Timae, and as I already said, externally on the surface, it looks very similar to what he does to Achilles. I at least think that Agamemnon's action is not justified because he, although he has suffered Timae, dishonored, loss of Timae, his loss of Timae differs from Achilles in some key ways. First of all, as I just explained, Agamemnon's loss of Timae is directly required by a god. It's not a matter of another human being. Now, if you go into the story, again, it's very interesting listening to sort of the the talk about the story in a contemporary university, but if you listen to the story, it has much more of that sense of of levels that Michael Levin is talking about be, between the human beings. Atreus' son had dishonored Chryses, priest of Apollo, when he... Atreus' son is Agamemnon. Came beside the uh, figure keeping track of all of the different ways of saying who these people are is a little difficult sort of like in a Russian novel but again if you remember the previous video where I talked a little bit about this you can find the the Iliad on the on the thumbnail if you're wondering which video the um, they're, they're, they describe people and the names that they use of people are all to fit into the, the meter of the poetry. Because remember, in Greek, this is a massive poem. The past ships of the Achaeans to ransom back his daughter, carrying gifts beyond count and holding in his hands, wound on a staff of gold, the ribbons of Apollo who strikes from afar and supplicated all the Achaeans. But above all, Atreus's two sons, the marshals of the people. Son Atreus's two sons are Agamemnon and Menelaus. Sons of Atreus, and you other strong grieved Achaeans, to you may the gods grunt who have their homes on Olympus, Priam's city to be plundered, and a fair homecoming thereafter. But may you give me back my own daughter, and take the ransom, giving honor to Zeus's son who strikes from afar, Apollo. Zeus's son who strikes from afar. Again, they're, they're using these, these codes because it keeps the meter. Then all the rest of the Achaeans cried out in favor that the priest be respected and the shining ransom be taken. Yet this pleased not the heart of Atreus's son Agamemnon, but harshly he drove him away with a strong order upon him. 
Never let me find you again, old sir, near our hollow ships, neither lingering now nor coming again hereafter, for fear your staff and the god's ribbons help you no longer. The girl I will not give back. Sooner will old age come upon her in my own house, in Argus, far from her own land, going up and down by the loom, and being in my bed as my companion. So go now. Do not make me angry, so you will be safer. So he spoke, and the old man in terror obeyed him, and went silently away beside the murmuring sea beach. Over and over the old man prayed as he walked in solitude to King Apollo, whom Leto of the lovely hair bore. Hear me, Lord of the Silver Bow, who set your power about Chrysi and Killer the Sacrosanct, who are lord in strength over Tenedos, Smentheus, if it ever pleased your heart that I built your temple, if ever it pleased you that I burned all the rich thigh pieces of bulls, of goats, then bring to pass this wish I pray for. Let your arrows make the Danaeans pay for my tears. The Danaeans are the Achaeans. They're, they're the Menelaus and everyone who's crossed the Aegean to Troy. Is shed. So he spoke in prayer, and Phoebus Apollo heard him, and strode down along the pinnacles of Olympus, angered in his heart, carrying across his shoulders the bow and the hooded quiver, and the shafts clashed on the shoulders of the god walking angrily. He came as night comes down, and knelt then apart and opposite the ships, and let go an arrow. Terrible was the clash that rose from the bow of silver. First he went after the mules and the circling hounds, then let go a tearing arrow against the men themselves. And You can see the, the plague starts with the mules and the hounds, and it goes to the men. Struck them. The corpse fires burned everywhere, and did not stop burning. Nine days up and down the host ranged the gods' arrows, but on the tenth Achilles called the people to assembly. I think Achilles is Achilles. Put into his mind by the goddess of the white arms, Hera, who had pity upon. So now you have the goddesses getting involved, and and you see this throughout the Iliad, and and again you, you sort of have these uh, human beings are, are are sort of down there in the middle. We're above the animals, but we're below the gods, and we're kind of looking up at the the Greeks are sort of looking up at the gods and 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 looking down at the people. Upon the Danaeans when she saw them dying. Now when they were all assembled in one place together, Achilles of the swift feet stood up among them and spoke forth. Son of Atreus, I believe now that straggling backwards we must make our way home if we can even escape death, if fighting now must crush the Achaeans and the plague likewise. Now, come, let us ask some holy man, some prophet, even an interpreter of dreams, since a dream also comes from Zeus, who can tell why Phoebus Apollo is so angry? If for the sake of some vow, some hecatomb, he blames us, if given the fragrant smoke of lambs, of he-goats, somehow he can be made willing to beat the bane aside from us. He spoke thus and sat down again, and among them stood up Calchas, Thestor's son, far the best of the bird interpreters, who knew all things that were, the things to come and the things past, who guided into the land of Ilion the ships of the Achaeans through that seer craft of his own that Phoebus Apollo gave him. He, in kind intention toward all, stood forth and addressed them. You have bidden me, Achilles, beloved of Zeus, to explain to you this anger of Apollo, the lord who strikes from afar. Then I will speak. Yet make me a promise, and swear before me readily by word and work of your hands to defend me, since I believe I <laughs> this is, this is, the little priest got a little something to worry about because if they're going to say something that the that the king doesn't like, um, you can find this in the Book of Kings in the Bible as well. It's like, don't you have a don't you have a servant of the Lord, King Ahab? Oh yeah, but he never tells me what I want. I shall make a man angry who holds great kingship over the men of Argos, and all the Achaeans obey him. For a king, when he is angry with a man beneath him, is too strong. And suppose, even for the day itself he swallowed down his anger, he still keeps bitterness that remains until its fulfillment de In other words, even if he doesn't kill me that day, he might hold a grudge, and he can really make my life terrible. So, Achilles, you gotta protect me. Deep in his chest. 
Speak forth, then. Tell me if you will protect me. Then in answer again spoke Achilles of the swift feet. Speak, interpreting whatever you know, and fear nothing. In the name of Apollo, beloved to Zeus, to whom you, Calchas, make your prayers when you interpret the gods' will to the Danaeans, no man so long as I am alive above earth and see daylight shall lay the weight of his hands on you beside the hollow ships, not one of all the Danaeans, even if you mean Agamemnon, who now claims to be the greatest of all the Achaeans. So he swears on Apollo that, that he will protect him. At this the blameless seer took courage again, and spoke forth. No, it is not for the sake of some vow or hecatomb he blames us, but for the sake of his priest, whom Agamemnon dishonored, and would not give him back his daughter, nor accept the ransom. Therefore the archer sent griefs against us, and will send them still, nor sooner thrust back the shameful plague from the Danaeans until we give the glancing-eyed girl back to her father without price, without ransom, and lead also a blessed hecatomb to Chrysi. Thus we might propitiate and persuade him. He spoke thus and sat down again, and among them stood up Atreus's son, the hero wide-ruling Agamemnon, raging, the heart within filled black to the brim with anger from beneath, but his two eyes showed like fire in their blazing. First of all he eyed Calchas bitterly and spoke to him, seer of evil, Never yet have you told me a good thing. Calchas is no dummy. Always the evil things are dear to your heart to prophesy, but nothing excellent have you said nor ever accomplished. Now notice how even the characters in here, these aren't, these aren't idiots. These aren't fools. They're, they're skeptical of, of oracles that they disagree with. That's, that's not, you know, they're not just little, little dupes to, to priests and oracles. Now once more you make divination to the Danaeans, argue forth your reason why he who strikes from afar afflicts them, because I, for the sake of the girl Chryses, would not take the shining ransom. And indeed I wish greatly to have her in my own house, since I like her better than Clytemnestra, my own wife, for in truth she is no way inferior, neither in bill. Now, <laughs> Agamemnon's wife is going to have... Uh... Um, some things, she's, she's going to get her, she's going to get her payback. Nor stature, nor wit, not in accomplishment. Still, I am willing to give her back, if such is the best way. I myself desire that my people be safe, not perish. Find me then some prize that shall be my own, lest I only among the Argives go without, since that were unfitting. You are all wit. No, notice how I can't go without. That would be unfitting. Well, unfitting for what? Unfitting for my stature. In other words, if I'm going to have to pay my teammate out in order to get rid of the plague, then there's going to have to be someone with a big price to play. And and by the way, Calchas, who who is backing you so that I can't take it out of your hide? This is to this thing that my prize goes elsewhere. Then in answer again spoke brilliant, swift-footed Achilles. Son of Atreus, most lordly, greediest for gain of all men, how shall the great-hearted Achaeans give you a prize now? There is no great store of things lying about I know of, but what we took from the cities by storm has... In other words, all the plunder's been given out. ...been distributed. It is unbecoming for the people to call back things once given... You can't, you can't take it away from someone once it's given. No. For the present, give the girl back to the god. We Achaeans thrice and four times over will repay you if ever Zeus gives into our hands the strong-walled citadel of Troy to be plundered. So if, if Troy gets taken, you'll get repaid. Then an answer. Again spoke powerful Agamemnon. Not that way. Good fighter though you be, godlike Achilles, strive to cheat... For you will not deceive. You will not persuade me. What do you want? To keep your own prize and have me sit here lacking one? Are you ordering me to give this girl back? Either the great-hearted Achaean shall give me a new prize, chosen according to my desire to atone for the girl lost, or else if they will not give me one, I myself shall take her. Your own prize? Or that of Aeus, 
or that of Odysseus, going myself in person, and he whom I visit will be bitter. Still, these are things we shall deliberate again hereafter. Come, now, we must haul a black ship down to the bright sea, and assemble rowers enough for it, and put on board it the Hecatomb, and the girl herself, Chryseis of the fair cheeks. And let there be one responsible man in charge of her, either Aeus or Idomeneus, or brilliant Odysseus, or you yourself, son of Peleus, most terrifying of all men, to reconcile by accomplishing sacrifice the archer. Now, what's interesting is that here in the story, this sort of upper-level consciousness, what, what the story reflects are, of course, the values and the oughts, and what we centuries later look at Agamemnon and say well you're the king you should suffer on behalf of the people that's it's a completely alien notion to this world of time and glory kleos it's, it's a completely alien notion the king doesn't suffer on behalf of the people everyone else suffers on behalf of the king and and so what you actually have is this organism that is that is above all of the people that is operating and, and what we begin to see is that well now we look at it across the centuries and you 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 we can't look at this and not hear agamemnon what would a good king do and even the even the college university professor that comments on this, well, she's, she's, her moral matrix has been changed. Well, changed by what? Well, changed by the king who, who not only gives of his in order to save the scourge of the people, but the king who gives his own life. And, and, and you see, see, you get the sense of these various levels of, there's purpose going on, and there's agency going on, and there's there's different levels of consciousness. But as as Peugeot will say, we don't we don't experience the consciousness at the high levels, but we have a sense of it, and we have a sense of the drama, and a sense of the interplay, and a sense of the health of the organism, and of course where this will all go. The, the whole point about the wrath of Achilles is that now he's not going to fight. He and the Myrmidons are going to say. You know, screw you, Agamemnon. You go attack the city without me. And of course, it's going to unfold and unfold and unfold and unfold. And Achilles will kill Hector. Spoiler alert, it's only been out a few thousand years. And Paris will kill Achilles, which is this really strange turn. How could, how could Paris and so Paris, who was the cause of all of this, and in the, and then you know Odysseus, he's going to take another ten years to to finally get back home. So this layer of purpose being again, we tend to say, well, there's no purpose to any of this. Well, why would you say that? There seems to be a purpose in the face of the tadpole. There seems to be a purpose built into the polar bear. Oh, well, that's just human projection. Or maybe imagining there is no purpose is a human projection. That's the scientific lab leak. Well, the ball doesn't fall on purpose. The dog doesn't the dog doesn't long for the ball on purpose. But I tend to think that Sam is right that we're just bringing purpose back in because we can't live without it. So I, I am out of time. Um, I, I don't. I'm not really satisfied with the conclusion of this drawing this all together. But I hope I put enough on the plate that you can sort of say, "Hmm, there's there's something there to consider." So uh, leave a message. Uh, leave a comment. Let me know what you think.